Good morning, everyone, in uh, the different uh, connections for multiple countries. Uh, welcome to today's uh, uh, video conference. Today it's uh, a little bit of a technical challenge because we will be coordinating the presentation uh, from uh, Amsterdam and uh, we will have a couple of video conference looped in, so bear with us if uh, you see that uh, technology lets us down. Now, uh, I'm going to call uh, the different offices to check the connection, as we usually do. Yerevan, can you hear us? Can you see us? Yeah, we can hear you. We can see you. Thank you very much. Reading you loud and clear. Thank you very much, Yerevan. We can see you and we can hear you perfectly well. Belarus, can you hear us? Can you see us? Good afternoon, Belarus, yes, reading you loud and clear. Thank you very much. We can see you and we can hear you perfectly well. Uh, Kazakhstan, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you see us? We see Astana now, but we cannot hear Astana. In the meantime, while Astana solves the audio problem, we'll go to Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan, can you see us? Can you hear us? Oh, actually, we can hear now Astana. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you very much. I can see you and uh, I can hear you. Also. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, can we go to. <laughs> we can see you now. Can. Yeah, we can hear you and we can see you. Yes, we can hear you. We uh, can hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moldova, can you see us? Can you hear us? Um, Kyrgyzstan, can you please close your microphone? Thank you very much. Moldova, can you hear us? Can you see us? I think we don't have Moldova with us today. Let's go in the meantime to Tajikistan. Dushanbe, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Good afternoon. We can see you, we can hear you perfectly well. Moving on to Ukraine. Hello, you can you hear us? Good, Good afternoon. Reading you loud and clear. Uh, and Uzbekistan, can you see us? Can you hear us? Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. I can hear you and I can see you. Uh, 
Now, can we go back to Moldova to see if uh, Kisinau hears us or sees us? No, I don't think we have a connection with Moldova. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our March uh, video conference. Uh, today, we'll be on the topic on how manage uh, and promote the integration of migrants through entrepreneurship policies. Uh, today we have with us Professor Jan Niesen. Professor Niesen uh, is joining us uh, on a video conference from Amsterdam, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he will be showing us uh, part of what he's uh, doing with uh, the Delhi project. The Delhi project means diversity in economy and local integration. And uh, he is uh, from the independence policy organization, think tank, migration policy group. who we know from uh, previous video conferences, uh, such as the MIPEX index last year. Um, so without much further introduction, um, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Nixon. Professor, the floor is yours. You can just go ahead. Okay. I, um, first of all, would like to greet you all in um, all the places you are working from. Except I uh, am based in Amsterdam and in and in in a project that is um, hosted by the Council of Europe. This project is known under the name DAILY, which um, stands for um, Diversity in the Economy and local integration. I've been asked by the World Bank to give a short presentation of what, it, what we are trying to achieve. And I am very pleased to, to do so. And I appreciate it very much that all the materials have translated into Russian. So you can read all that at your leisure um, after the meeting. And I will be happy to answer any questions if you may have them What we aim to achieve in Delhi is to um, support immigrants when they want to set up small businesses. And in order to be able to do this, we are setting up so-called public-private partnerships, 
We will develop um, quality management standards on how to support immigrant and So that um, by bringing together the various stakeholders, um, we can um, we can join efforts and avoid duplication. So we want to engage as much as possible stakeholders. And before actually working on those kind of issues, we need to make sure that we know who is doing what. This is what we have called a self-assessment. Also, we uh, I think that it is very important that once you are part of this project, you um, set up a communication strategy so as to reach out to as many as possible stakeholders. Now, working with immigrant entrepreneurs and small businesses, means that we want to connect them with what we call the mainstream, the wider economy. Because we think that um, including them and connecting them with the wider economy helps their social integration. Now, to help all partners involved, we are designing a set of standards. And I will talk about those uh, in this very soon, um, but just to say that these standards must be seen as kind of a handbook of what is what you can and should do and what you should better not do. And by doing that internationally, we link participants in various cities across the world. So that I can learn from good practice. Okay, now we came to the conclusion that there are five areas that are important uh, when you work on these kind of issues. I will mention them and you will see them on your screen. I will mention them briefly and then um, after that I will say more about each of them. Well, the first one is if you want to do something, you need a policy. You need to know what it is what you are going to do as a governmental agent. Secondly, um, when once you know what it is what you want, uh, you will see that you have to take a lot of measures that are of direct support um, to immigrants and nerves, which will, which will 
which will help them to uh, become a better businessman or woman. Okay. Then, thirdly, we are looking at how immigrant entrepreneurs can link national networks of entrepreneurs. And fourth, we will look at how um, and how can immigrant entrepreneurs be given access to funds. And last but not least, we are going to see how public and private organizations and use their purchasing power to achieve socio-economic integration goals. Okay, so let me then turn to the first issue, namely policies that needs to be put in place. It is crucially important that when you are doing that, you, you start with consulting with the immigrant entrepreneurs, but also with national entrepreneurs, governmental departments dealing with business development or economic development. You bring them together and discuss what is best that can be done. Equally. Okay. Equally, it is important that you collect as much as possible data. What, how many uh, immigrant entrepreneurs are there? What type of economic activities do they undertake? How big or small are their businesses and um, what type of markets do they serve? So if you have gathered your stakeholders around the table and you have information, you begin to set some targets and be very clear of what it is what you want to achieve, and you, make, and you make sure that you monitor um, and measure the progress you make in implementing your program. And as I said, you have a communication strategy to reach out to the immigrant community and the wider community. Because this helps to make clear that immigrants quite often contribute to the local and national economy. And in this way, helps to um, take away or uh, um, yeah, take away all kinds of prejudices that are out there. Now, let's move on to the second thing you have to do: supporting immigrants to develop their skills. Now, immigrant entrepreneurs and national entrepreneurs and businessmen 
may have the same or similar problems. And it is important that you make an inventory of the problems they are facing. And you also want to make an inventory of the things and services that are already there to, to confront those problems and support. It then also becomes clear what kind of things you should do to tackle specific problems of immigrants. Because they may have problems uh, national uh, uh, issues such as, for example, uh, permits. Um, it is much difficult for immigrants to get a permit to start a business than nationals, for example. It is sometimes easier, uh, d more difficult for female entrepreneurs among, among them to get those papers, etc. So when you make an inventory of problems and of what is being offered uh, already to solve those problems, you still hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, we hear you. Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay, okay because the translation was um, disappeared, so I, I, I wasn't sure whether I was still there. So when you uh, have made um, have, have made an inventory of problems and of that are already there, you see indeed additional and specific measures need to be taken and can be taken to help immigrants and Now let me then turn to the third um, issue that needs to um, be addressed when you work on these kind of issues. Like is the case for every businessman or woman, um, you need to be in touch with other business and business owners. This is vitally important for all businessmen and women. I just continue because I don't hear the interpretation anymore. This is, a, this is simultaneous interpretation. The interpreters are... Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then I... Oh, it's, it's simultaneous. Uh, they're very good okay. at catching it. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So being connected is extremely important um, for every businessman and women. Um, but often we know that immigrants have difficulties in precisely becoming a member of existing networks of um, national um, businessmen and women. And it is important that existing networks and organizations become aware that there are immigrant entrepreneurs around there as well, and that it is important for these organizations to open up um, and welcome as member um, these immigrant entrepreneurs. In other words, these organizations uh, will become and have to become more open and inclusive. Now, what we also do in daily in all the cities we are operating, um, we create for precisely that reason, we create platforms for cooperation where the different entrepreneurs, national and immigrant entrepreneurs, meet, exchange ideas, see what business opportunities are out there, 
and indeed begin to, to do business with each other. And also, um, they could together see what type of further skills and competence development they, they need and whether they can learn from each other, even though they sometimes are competitors. They all have an interest in uh, improving the business climate um, so that more business um, w will, will be made possible. Now, if I then turn to the uh, next and fourth uh, issue, and, and that is namely the issue of access to finance. We all know that um, starting a business um, requires that um, the business owner, be they men or, or women, uh, that they have money available to, 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 to get it all started. And quite often, when you start small, um, the money is provided by family uh, or friends. Um, sometimes people have some some little capital that they um, that they use to get started. But if the ambition of the immigrant entrepreneur is a bit thicker, um, he or she wants to go over and beyond a very small business that is only uh, serving a small niche market. Um, they will need more capital. And it is our experience when they turn to commercial banks, they are not always uh, received um, and, and provided with the necessary um, financing. It turns out that it is much more difficult for immigrant entrepreneurs to actually get uh, uh, access to finance. And that often blocks the further development of their business, um, their, their growth, but also their sustainability. And it is therefore that we started in the project conversations with banks who, uh, which attended the platforms we have created. Um, we started to have a conversation with them and, and asked them what type of uh, support they can give to immigrant entrepreneurs. And that ranges from microcredits um, to preferential um, uh, and lower interest rates, um, but also other support in helping immigrant entrepreneurs to make a business plan. Um, sometimes banks um, um, provide a mentor, someone related to the bank, who worked for a while with the uh, immigrant entrepreneur um, to help him or her to understand what you have to do to qualify for a bank loan. And that um, is, is, is often, that type of work is often supported and guaranteed by a municipality who think, um, which thinks that, that it is important that more entrepreneurs contribute to the local economy. Now, let me now turn to uh, a last thing uh, that, that the Project Delhi is doing and what is important for the promotion of immigrant entrepreneurship. The, and that is the following, and I need to explain that first. Um, if you make and support uh, entrepreneurs to become more stable um, and secure in their business, when their businesses grow and begin to really uh, uh, become stronger um, and more sustainable um, um, businesses, 
the next step actually is to link them to the local and national economy. What we want to avoid here in this part of Europe is that immigrant entrepreneurs only serve a very small market, often referred to as an ethnic market, um, that they only produce goods that are of interest for the immigrant communities in terms of food or um, all kinds of other services, um, uh, accommodation services, and, and, and even um, travel and food um, uh, services. We think that that would, in the longer run, be uh, not strong enough a basis for immigrant businesses to survive. We have to link them to the mainstream economy. And the way to do that is to get them becoming a supplier and suppliers to other businesses, be they small or big, and, and that is important, become a supplier to local and national governments. I do not know uh, how it is in your part of the world, but in Europe, uh, but also in North America, local and national governments are often big buyers of goods and services. And we have asked the question, to what extent is government, when it uh, is buying its goods and services, is it also, not un uniquely, but is it also buying from immigrant entrepreneurs? And if it were to do so, it would actually achieve two things at the same time. It will support the entrepreneurs to become a stable. Um, business. It will also support their social integration and their integration into society because, as we all know, economic integration leads to, uh, to social integration. Now, this is um, what we call using purchasing power to achieve social and economic integration goals. This is not about preferential treatment, um, preferring certain businesses of immigrants because they are immigrants, but it is basically to make sure that all entrepreneurs have an equal opportunity to bid for contracts, be that of private organizations or, as I said, of public organizations, governments that are purchases of goods and services as well. Now, that is an, um, a technique, if you want, a procurement. The buying of goods and services is, is complicated. Um, those who want to buy those goods and services want to have value for money. Uh, being assured that once someone is awarded a contract, he or she can indeed deliver. But it is equally important to make sure that indeed every entrepreneur has an equal opportunity to bid for contracts. And we have noticed in Europe that quite often uh, immigrant entrepreneurs are not enough or aware or not aware at all that um, they can try to sell goods and services to government and to other bigger uh, purchasing organizations. And it is with those organizations, public and private purchasing organizations, we are talking to reach out to the immigrant entrepreneurs community to make known that they can that they also can bid um, for contracts. Um, we are convincing those organizations to 
to make as clear as possible what the procedures are, because immigrants are not always aware of that. Um, whereas national entrepreneurs may be aware of it. And we think from the point of view of equal opportunity, but also from a business point of view, it is better that there is uh, indeed competition, but that everybody is equally participating in that competition, because you will get then the best contract possible. And so we are talking then with the purchasing organizations to reach out and add immigrant entrepreneurs to their pool of su potential suppliers. But at the same time, you are also talking to the immigrant entrepreneurs, um, helping them to better understand procurement procedures. Again, um, again, this is important because that for them would mean that they will be linked to the uh, national and local economy. Now, this is in short, and I couldn't do it shorter, um, what we try to achieve with daily. So fostering the capacities of immigrant entrepreneurs um, on the one hand, and secondly, preparing mainstream or national organizations uh, to um, include and help them to include immigrant entrepreneurs in their pool of suppliers. And those two strands of work um, are going on right now. I would argue that um, this can be done in many countries, because in our project we have countries and cities which have a long tradition of immigration, Germany, um, the Netherlands, Austria. They deal with issues of immigrant and immigrant integration for a long time. But we also have countries that only since recently um, um, are dealing with those issues, which, for example, is the case with Spain, which is a, a country of recent, a, re, a country that only since uh, since the last 10 years is dealing with it. So we have newer and older immigration countries, and likewise we have cities with smaller and bigger immigrant populations. Um, we have countries and cities where um, immigrant entrepreneurship is very important, and we have countries where it isn't important. And this is an interesting mix, because in this way, everyone involved um, can learn from each other. And that is exactly what, what I'm doing uh, at this very moment, bringing people together from those various and different backgrounds to learn from each other. So it can apply it also in countries, um, in your countries. Um, it all depends, as I said, it all depends on, yes, of course, you must have immigrants. Preferably the, the group of immigrants is, is, is big enough, um, which warrants that, that you become active. There should be immigrant entrepreneurs among them. Uh, but usually there are, um, and of course it requires your determination to work on it. And that depends, is our experience, um, that depends very much on whether you see the value of it. And it is, and, and in two sentences I will say what we think the value of all this is. And, and by doing, and after that, I will will uh, come to a conclusion uh, of of my introduction. The value is indeed that um, the contribution of immigrants to the local economy. Um, it is not only the case that um, 
immigrants are workers or are people who are a drain on public sources. There are increasingly in Western Europe um, uh, um, groups of immigrants that actually contribute um, to the economy and also businesses have discovered um, that immigrants are interesting partners also for example because they have links with their country of origin um, and help um, national businesses um, with finding new markets markets in their countries of origin so there is a win-win situation for for the immigrants and and the uh, societies they operate in um, and um, for national businesses so there's a big economic interest which is immediately followed by a big social interest because when people in uh, in uh, in those countries begin to see how useful immigrants are um, they will um, be more receptive and open to welcome them among yourselves um, and, and again um, take away some prejudices so there are interesting um, gains to be made the way to do it is as I said is determination really wanting to do it and the creation of an informal platform of consultation um, with the various stakeholders because you have to work with the immigrants uh, businesses with the immigrant communities as well as with the national businessmen and women um, to make it all happen so thank you very much um, for uh, your attention uh, it was a pleasure to make this presentation and um, I'm very happy to to answer questions um, um, when when there are questions uh, either today or um, you know through Anna and the World Bank um, at a later stage thank you very much thank you very much professor for uh, your presentation I think it was very uh, enlightening indeed especially for some of our near pal countries since uh, some of them have uh, thank you. since some of them have a big tradition of uh, migrants uh, such as Russia that require some integration or uh, as other countries such as for example uh, Armenia who have integration programs for returning migrants uh, uh, the same is uh, true for for example Moldova unfortunately I, I'm not sure if they managed to connect later on during during your presentation or not um, so why don't we actually start with uh, Armenia to check if uh, if they have questions uh, uh, Yerevan uh, do you have any any questions No, at this point we do not have any questions. Uh, there are questions from Uzbekistan. Uh, do, uh, would you please tell us whether you have any successful practices of integration of uh, uh, immigrant entrepreneurs in uh, the um, national economy of some region or country? or some local economy and uh, how did uh, and how uh, was that success achieved uh, through which factors thank you for your answer okay let me take the example of München which is a big and, and economically speaking very important city in Germany and actually I, I I was at a, a conference yesterday uh, in München where I met with a great number of immigrant entrepreneurs. Now their um, inclusion, um, their contribution to the local economy is recognized by the mayor on the one hand, but also by the other um, economic players in the city 
they have indeed seen that immigrant entrepreneurs in that city in that city have something national entrepreneurs often miss usually immigrant entrepreneurs are more flexible in responding to economic changes um, usually they work harder and are sharper um, in in the competition um, than national entrepreneurs and for bigger companies this is indeed important because by tapping into that pool of suppliers um, they they themselves become more competitive in the global market now in München um, there is an annual prize for the most successful uh, entrepreneur and I met two winners of, of such a prize which by the way is a big recognition not only for the entrepreneur but also from the community um, he or she is coming from and these were one was a person who um, actually was originally from Vietnam who started a big um, cleaning service um, and um, employing now 200 persons um, and um, by uh, uh, acting as a successful business she also um, prospered herself but also employed so many people um, not only immigrants uh, but um, also Germans um, which was also acknowledged as a great achievement so there are many of those examples um, the argument we have in, in, in all those cities where I am is that these good examples do not get enough um, let's say followers um, and we think there is a big potential out there that if people know of these good examples and how to do it, um, you will get more of them. Now, if to answer your question, how do you do it? I don't want to repeat what I what I have said over the last uh, half hour, but it all has to do with ha helping immigrant entrepreneurs to become better entrepreneurs by helping them to develop their skills what is it what it, uh, what is it what you have to do if you are a Vietnamese immigrant and you want to become a business woman um, in München what is it what you have to do so help you know the München uh, agency to support entrepreneurship has helped this woman to become a good entrepreneur respecting the law um, what it is what you have to do in Germany to to present your case you have to have a, a, a business plan that needs to be approved and so on and so forth so there was this direct support to this woman she found money herself in the first instance to start her business but when the business was successful, she was able to um, to get more financial support uh, from banks, and the banks were willing to do that because, um, you know, it was made very clear to them that, that this this woman was a safe bet, and so on and so forth. Linking her, she was linked to a group of other entrepreneurs and people coming from other parts of the world and and so they they started to learn from each other and also begin to do business with each other this is how it worked okay thank you very much thank you Uzbekistan, is there any more questions? Uh, no, thank you. We have no other uh, questions. Then we go back to Armenia. Yeah, I think Yerevan was interrupted uh, when uh, we were taking their question. 
пожалуйста, задать вопрос. Мы уже прерывали э, связь в площадке. Пожалуйста, участвовать есть возможно, задайте свой вопрос. Спасибо за предоставленную возможность. У меня один вот такой вопрос. Насколько, ну, если говорить на примере Армении, то вот вопросы о госзакупках, о привлечении какой-либо компании, это регулируется администрацией гражданским кодексом. И там как бы нету градации между мигрантами и немигрантами. Я думаю, что примерно та же самая ситуация и в прочих странах бывшего Советского Союза. И хотелось бы узнать, вот какие как бы, детальные рекомендации есть по привлечению рабочей силы мигрантов в тех странах, в которых вопросы госзакупок и прочие экономические вопросы регулируются с помощью гражданского кодекса. Спасибо. Let me try to specify then, once again, all employment-related issues, all the interactions between public and private entities in Armenia are governed by the civil code. And uh, by definition, the civil code applies to everybody, whether you are migrant or non-migrant, immigrant or not immigrant. For a company to be eligible to participate in public procurement, the company must be registered in a country, must be a legal entity in this particular country. And therefore, it doesn't really matter if uh, the company is established by an immigrant or not. Now, uh, my question is, uh, if we take Germany or any other country uh, that uh, provide targeted assistance uh, to immigrants, what kind of issues or problems were identified uh, at the municipal or uh, the national level uh, when engaging such entities in public procurement processes? Okay, let me see whether I understood this correctly. Well, first of all, it is absolutely, absolutely clear that indeed um, in the countries I'm working in, um, any entrepreneur, irrespective of the background of the owner, any of them must be officially registered um, and must have um, a clean record when it comes to certain requirements under national law, ranging from respecting labor law, um, not, at, not being convicted for fraud, and so on and so forth. All businesses should, should be able to demonstrate that they are a company registered um, um, like that. And that um, indeed applies to those who are owned by immigrants and those by nationals. But, however, it is far more easy for national companies to bid for contracts than it is for those with an immigrant background. Immigrants um, may not be included in networks where call for public tenders circulate. Immigrants may not have the experience to uh, prepare a bid for such a public call for tender. Sometimes um, things, uh, requirements are formulated as such that it is almost impossible for an immigrant to apply, for example, proving that he or she has uh, no criminal record at all. Um, and that is not always easy for an immigrant to get from his or her country of origin um, that has a different tradition in recording these kind of things and sharing records of that with, with other, uh, with third parties. So there are a range of issues um, that, that play a role that makes uh, it, 
that immigrant entrepreneurs actually are lagging behind or do not have real equal opportunity to compete. Now, in order to level the playing field, uh, this project proposes that um, governments uh, cast their net so wide that indeed all entrepreneurs can apply again not to give preferential treatment, but make sure that everybody has a fair chance. And that means, in this case, reach out to potential suppliers um, to explain or to announce that there will be a call for tender. Secondly, by um, explaining what the call actually will be, um, what the tender specifications actually entail, um, and so on and so forth. So in that way, again, you secure as a purchasing organization that you get as many as possible qualified bids from which you then can pick. When we promote immigrant entrepreneurship, we don't give them preferential treatment. We want to make sure that they are on an equal footing and equally competent and strong um, to, uh, to compete. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, yes, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Any more questions from Armenia? No, thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, Belarus. with questions. Thank you. Not at the moment, no, thank you. Very much. Uh, we move on to Astana. Thank you. No questions from Astana. Uh, Kyrgyzstan. Thank you very much, Professor, for a very informative presentation. We represent the Institute for Strategic Studies of Kyrgyzstan and would like to ask a question. As you may be aware, Kyrgyzstan and uh, several of the countries participating in our VC are uh, not receiving countries, uh, but countries uh, that actually send uh, their migrants to other countries. So what uh, uh, kind of uh, participation you might see for us in this project? Would it be possible to participate on a bilateral basis, or maybe uh, there may be some other opportunities for that? Thank you. Uh, interesting question. Thank you very much. Let me try to answer it. Um, we noticed that in various cities we operate, there are chambers of commerce from other than the national, or the other countries, um, from other countries operating in those countries. And so in, um, in Germany, there is a chamber of commerce um, from countries on the Balkans. Um, and we have seen it in other cities, and I, I, I don't have another example as coming now directly to me, but there are many countries where there are business links established by the either chambers of commerce of those countries or directly the government through embassies, um, you know, uh, their economic attaché or, or something like that, which are there for two reasons, basically, to promote um, business exchange or the exchange of goods and services, um, economic cooperation between those countries. Now, immigrants could play a very interesting 
uh, facilitating role um, in in all of that, and we 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 have seen examples of it. And, helping on the one hand, indeed, um, to link national businesses with businesses in the countries of origin. Um, and, um, you know, business in countries of origin that want, want to expand their markets to, to, to countries where immigrants live, um, they also uh, use, use, if you want, immigrants. And, and so it all depends on what you want as a country, if you say from our country we have a significant number of people living um, in country X or country I or in a big city in Europe, um, you could decide to see what the business potential is and the, the possible advantage you, you want to take um, from that fact. Um, you may wish to contact these people to see whether there are businessmen or women among them uh, and what type of support they could use um, from you so that they indeed um, become to be seen as an important link between the, the economy or businesses in the country they live in and the country they come from. And, and so that is what, what what you can do, um, and I have seen. I, I mean, we we had a business roundtable in Bucharest, and 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 um, that was now a year ago, and and we we had the Chinese ambassador and the French ambassador uh, attending that event because they both knew um, that this could be very interesting for business relations between the two, the three countries actually, you know, Romania and China, Romania and France. So there are ways that you could, but it depends again very much on what it is what you want, where your people are, and what type of migrants they are. Are they indeed businessmen and business women? I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I've got uh, several more questions to ask. Uh, thanks for your presentation. A very nice step-by-step uh, -step, uh, description of the project. But uh, unfortunately, uh, you didn't uh, seem to reflect on failures and risks in implementing uh, such projects. Our countries are post-Soviet countries, former Soviet republics, and uh, there are several aspects that might kill uh, such projects altogether. To begin with, it's corruption. Uh, then uh, take, uh, for example, our country, Kyrgyzstan, uh, that was hit by ethnic conflict in 2006. And implementation of such project, uh, say, in our country, can be uh, hijacked by destructive forces to fuel conflicts. And besides, uh, we should not discount uh, various uh, attempts at uh, criminal activities that uh, would target uh, immigrant uh, businesses. So I wonder if you considered such risks in your project, and uh, if so, what governments and other stakeholders might do? That's my first question. And the second question, if I may. Now, the second sure. question uh, is as follows. Well, I'm somewhat digressing, but still, in the course of your work under Migration Policy Group, I wonder if you studied uh, the engagement of uh, ethnic communities in uh, the development of uh, national economies. Not necessarily migrants, but uh, say people who left their native country uh, and uh, have uh, become citizens of other countries, whether they uh, were engaged in developing their uh, countries of origin once they have become citizens of other countries. Thank you. Let me start with the last question first, because that, that, that can answer easily. The, the first question is more complicated. So let me take the easy thing first. 
Um, yes, there are numerous examples of how immigrants continue to contribute um, to the country of origin through transfers of money and transfers of money, uh, of knowledge. Um, so re we all know the story of remittances. So what immigrants send back to the countries of origin, Armenia, by the way, is, 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 is a case that springs to mind immediately, uh, but it applies to others as well. Um, remittances are extremely important for the economy of, of, of the country of or origin. And also um, returning immigrants often uh, bring a lot of knowledge and skills back um, to to the country they they come from, and the, yeah, the examples are are very very numerous. Uh, I I can go on for for ages to 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 to, to demonstrate that. Um, as to your first question, um, corruption and fraud. Um, yes, this is indirectly tackled um, in, in the project, indirectly. First of all, we, you should not forget that what we do is, is, is a supportive role. I'm, I'm not the government, and the Council of Europe is not the government of an individual city or an individual country. So, so our role is supportive. Um, um, in, in this project. But sure, uh, fraud um, and corruption is um, seen as an issue. And I can think, um, now let me reformulate that. Public procurement, so the way governments are spending it, its money, is under scrutiny, um, but we all a very severe scrutiny um, because governments constantly have to demonstrate how they spend their money, including um, how they spend it on buying goods and services. Um, procurement rules in the EU, um, in the European Union, and international um, um, global organizations have very strict procurement rules, even to the point that, that procurers uh, become desperate um, by, by the, the enormous number of, of rules. But the, the core of them is is actually transparency. Um, public procurement must be very transparent, so that there is a public call for tender, uh, which is public, um, and the award criteria, the tender specifications, all is very public, and also the outcome, the award, um, is, is public, um, even to the point that if you don't win a win contract, uh, a government has to explain why. So there is a fair amount of transparency that, that um, should um, help to go against favoritism um, and fraud. But we also know that that is not always successful um, and that um, fraud takes place. Um, uh, we all know that. But the, the, the thing you can do against it is, again, transparency uh, so that um, everyone in the public can see, um, you know, whether or not the rules are, are applied. Um, now, so, so in that sense, we, we address it. Um, now, I do not know very well your country. And if I were asked um, um, to advise you, I, I would start with a whole series of questions um, related to uh, the composition of the population. If you say we 
we have various ethnic groups um, and, and there, there, there is tension uh, between them. These are all things you have to take into consideration if you begin to work on this area, but I don't know the situation enough. What I see in the country of England and, and one of the boroughs of London is, is in our project. Um, London's population is, is, is very ethnically diverse. Um, people from Africa, the Caribbean, uh, Asia, um, and in one way or another, they 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 are their competitors in business, but at the same time, um, they are living together in this wonderful city of London. Um, so, being of a different background, ethnically speaking, does not necessarily mean that um, that it leads to tensions or an outburst of violence. Although we have had that in London as well. Um, uh, in, 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 in the recent past. But I would need to know much more of your country and see whether it, it, it makes sense um, and, 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 and what it is what you can do. Important is that um, there should be a government that works, is uh, respecting the rule of law, um, um, and, and um, is transparent to a great extent. That is absolutely important. Okay. Does that answer the question? Indeed, thank you very much. Uh, I would take this opportunity uh, using Bishkek's previous question on engaging compatriots and how to continue their contributions from abroad to announce that next month, uh, April 17, uh, will take place the next video conference specifically on this subject, how to engage compatriots abroad through specific policies. So I thought it was an appropriate comment to make before going on to our next uh, country. Uh, I don't know if Moldova managed to connect uh, during the presentation. Is Moldova there? No, I think Kishino didn't connect. So, uh, Tajikistan. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for a very in-depth and stimulating presentation. My question is, what is the link between economic integration and labor migration in your country? Thank you. Sorry, can you repeat it? Because the beginning, of it, it went too quick. What is the link uh, between, once again, what is the link uh, between economic uh, integration and labor migration as pursued in your country? Okay. Um, as I understand the question, I, 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 I would like to answer the following. There are countries where I, I, it is safe to say that in most countries, um, economic migration is mainly mm, on um, concerns mainly workers. So it is labor migration, be that highly qualified, uh, semi-qualified, less qualified, and even unqualified. Um, so so that, that is the majority and the, uh, there is a minority of what we could call business uh, migration. Looking at the immigrant population than those who have settled, we, we see that, you know, especially when immigrants stay for a longer period, they also begin to th to think, yeah, why, why don't I become an entrepreneur? And as we all know, not everybody is an entrepreneur. 
you know, you, you, you must have certain skills and you must have appetite for it. Um, but so, so it will, over time, you will see more um, immigrants becoming inclined to become an entrepreneur. And recent studies in, for example, the Netherlands and, 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 that, and Germany and other countries is, is that actually the startups, business startups, um, are, most, are more done by immigrants and people with an immigrant background than by nationals. Which, which is the case in Germany and in the Netherlands, I know for sure, and I think it is the same in, in the UK. So there is a big inclination um, among the immigrant, a bigger inclination um, among the immigrant population to indeed become a businessman or a woman, um, bigger than among the, 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 the nationals. Now, why? would one become an entrepreneur. Um, there is indeed, and, and bringing, an, an, you know, there are many factors, but one is, um, uh, and, and that, that is coming back time and again, that when immigrants get out of a job, um, they take this as a second option, the second best option. Because if you don't have work, and you still want to do something. You may try to become a self-employed person. You, you begin to to do work and and um, for yourself on your own, um, from cab driver to um, pizza delivery, um, if you want. And then you begin to think about uh, setting up your own business. So th there is, in that sense, a relationship um, between. Um, between employment, unemployment, and business creation. But as I said, um, it is one factor. The others really relate to your own background. It is interesting to see that uh, we see increasingly immigrant women setting up businesses, which, by the way, are usually as a, uh, at least that is what I was told in München yesterday, are usually more sustainable than that of men, which, which we found all very interesting. But the increasing number of immigrant women setting up their own businesses. Um, uh, so, so there, as I said, there are many Factors. It could be the country of origin. I mean, some in some countries, um, and, uh, people are more entrepreneurial. Um, it, it, it could could be many factors that lead to it. But one of them is indeed uh, the position on the labour market. Does that answer your question, sir? I don't hear anything. Thank you, thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dushanbe. Um, we go to Ukraine. Are there any questions in Kiev? Thank you for the most informative presentation. We've got no questions. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Kiev. And uh, since we started with uh, Uzbekistan, I think that uh, concludes the rounds uh, for our uh, connected colleagues. Uh, so we go to Moscow to our colleagues who are present today with us. Um, I don't know if, yes, we do have questions from our colleagues in Moscow. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for a most interesting presentation. My question uh, refers to barriers uh, that entrepreneurs might encounter when trying to register their businesses. In Russia, in other CIS countries, uh, entrepreneurs, in order to register their businesses, have to have uh, residence permits, either permanent or temporary residence permits. And they have to have some documentation in order to get registered. Now, in the course of your study, in the course of your research uh, done for the EU countries, I wonder if you identified any barriers to registering businesses in these countries. Thank you. Uh, 
I, I should say that I, 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 I don't know Russia uh, at all and, and the system of registering um, immigrants and issuing permits. Um, I think we included Armenia in our work, uh, um, actually, with, 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 no, it was not the World Bank. I think it was with the OECE. Um, so I, I, I know a bit about Armenia, but I, I, I cannot speak with any authority about, uh, about Russia. What I, I know is that the registration of businesses are in, 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 in Europe, in my part of the world, um, are differently arranged. Um, and there are different, um, let's say, there are different agencies that are, are dealing with it. In some countries, it is the Chamber of Commerce where you have to be registered um, as a company. Um, in others, it is a governmental department, um, and, and, and that differs. Generally speaking, the conditions um, for registering include uh, a residence permit or a passport. Um, um, but I cannot actually say how that is in, in other countries, but um, in the countries we operate in this project, um, um, yes, you have to be a legally residing uh, immigrant, um, first or second generation, um, and, and um, register as an official company. Now, in we know that, um, I know that from other situations, also sometimes in, in labor market issues that applies, that sometimes you don't get a residence permit because you are not employed. Um, and you are not getting employed because you um, don't have a residence permit. So you're in a vicious circle. That could also be the case with immigrant businesses. and. That is why I said a couple of times in my intervention, um, if you want to work on these kind of things, you must have the will and the resolve to work on those issues. So you have to indeed recognize the value of the contribution of immigrants to the economy, be that locally or regionally, and then facilitate it. So if if it requires, requires a residence permit, I would say to the authorities, then issue one so that a, a person can become economically active and is not marginalized or driven into a black economy. Um, um, so it depends very, very much on, on what governments want um, and, and how bureaucratic they, they, they operate. Is that helpful at all? Uh, yes, we have. Yes, thank you very much, Professor. We have another question. If I may, two small questions. Is my understanding correct that when you're talking about the immigrant entrepreneurs, you're not only talking about the foreign citizens in the country, but the citizens in the country uh, who have some immigrant background, like uh, immigrants of the second or third generation. What kind of immigrants uh, you're talking about? The first wave immigrants or their offspring as well? The second question is about the contribution of the immigrants in uh, the economy. Did you undertake a special research in your project or did you or are you based on some other uh, assessments on what, uh, on the, let's say, quantitative uh, assessment of, the, uh, of their contribution to the local economy, uh, whether it was a money equivalent or some other kind of equivalent, uh, well, to understand what kind of contribution we're talking about when we're talking about the contribution of the immigrants into the local or national economy? Thank you. Okay. As to your first question, um, you may have noticed that I often use the word persons with an immigrant background. And that could be the first generation migrant um, 
as well as his or her children. Uh, it could be people who lived there, who lived in a country of immigration for 20 years without becoming a citizen. But it could also someone who, after having lived there for seven years, um, is accepted as a new citizen. Um, and that's why we use the word persons with an immigrant background uh, a lot. And, um, uh, and, and how that plays out in, in the various countries is, is slightly different, but the term really covers what it is what we want to cover. Now, where um, the establishment of businesses by non-nationals, um, so let's say I'm Dutch and I want to open a, a business in uh, Armenia, um, what I, in that case, would do is, is inquire here at the embassy um, um, or try to get uh, Yerevan and, 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 and talk to the, the Chamber of Commerce and speak with the Dutch embassy there to see what the requirements are for, for um, a non-nationals wanting to open a business. I mean, big companies do that all the time, uh, you know, so, but, but we don't look at that, that. So we are dealing with people who are officially recognized as immigrants. So they are legally residing in the country, one. Secondly, we look at their children who may become or are not or don't become a citizen of, of the country they live in. The other interesting thing is that, and, and we noticed that in Dublin and Vienna, is that um, these cities want to become uh, a hub for new businesses, for what they call startups. They hope that they will attract from abroad um, young, usually young, talented people who through a small own business bring skills and competences and contacts, business contacts uh, in other countries to particular countries. And even country, uh, cities like Vienna and Dublin see each other as competitors. They want to really attract those entrepreneurs to come to Vienna and to to Dublin. And I, what I know is Stuttgart is doing the same. So, you, you know, offering very interesting conditions to start a business in the cities um, so as to uh, have these new type of business bring something new to the local economy. So it happens. That answers quite your question, I guess. Yes, and uh, what about the second question about the impact uh, uh, of immigrant entrepreneurs? On the? In the quantitative... Uh, um, ah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, this is what we have suggested the, the cities would do themselves. So we didn't do the research, but we first had to make the argument that um, immigrants are contributors to your local economy. And if you, um, if, if you have been able to, to raise this as an issue, um, then you have to invite them um, to begin to collect um, information. Usually you start doing that by case studies, looking at sectors and say, hey, immigrants are very operating in those sectors, and, and, and so we assume it is important. But there is very little research done, and again, our project aim to get cities to to spend more research or resources on that. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions from uh, our Moscow colleagues? It seems not. Um, 
any more questions from our colleagues connected through VC that might have uh, sprung up in the past few minutes? Okay, then um, I think with that last question, we conclude our session for today. I would like to thank, of course, uh, Professor Nielsen for having a very informative talk. Um, I would like to thank all the participants in the different countries. Today we had participants from different NGOs, from IOM, from UN Women, from the World Bank. Uh, so thank you all for your participation. I would like to thank our interpreters for the wonderful job and our technicians uh, who managed to connect uh, our very complicated setup. And I would invite you all to join us for our next video conference. It'll take place on April 17 uh, through the same usual uh, locations. We're now going back to our official uh, or usual time of uh, 12 p.m. Moscow time. Uh, we will adjust, of course, uh, I believe it's Kisinau and uh, Kiev that changed to daylight saving times uh, in the next um, in the next weekend. So uh, I think that we will uh, send the invitations with the corrected times and so on. And if nobody else has anything more to say, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much for your participation, and see you next month. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.